very good morning i bring in greetings from indian society of gastroenterology we are coming with yet another master class series that is series 5 and a new lecture on a very important topic of cystic lesions of the pancreas and we have a very eminent faculty and a leading gastroenterologist who was the secretary general of indian um, uh, society of gastroenterology endoscopy of india who is at delhi dr rajesh puri is moderating and we have the speaker dr sudeep tadar choudhury so he is uh, dr rajesh puri is a well known figure in india he is the vice chairman in interventional gastroenterology and in the institute of digestive disease and hepatobiliary sciences in medanda gurugram so let me request dr rajesh puri to take over and introduce the speaker and the subject dr rajesh puri yeah thank you dr matthew philip sir for giving the introduction and i would like to thank the isg govin dr govin makaria and dr matthew philip and the today session the speaker will be dr sudipto dar choudhury professor and head department of gastroenterology christian medical college vellore india and is a well known figure in the pancreas and is going to talk on the approach to the cystic lesion of the pancreas and i request dr sudipto dar to take the proceedings uh thank you dr puri for the kind introduction uh, i'll just start sharing my slides at the very outset i'd like to thank indian society of gastroenterology and dr matthew philip uh, dr makaria for giving me this opportunity and also i would like to thank dr rajesh puri for chairing the session without much ado i'll just start off with this topic which is approach to cystic lesions of the pancreas just to confirm tech support is okay with the voice and the images yes everything is thank fine thank you sir. thank you so much sir. so uh would you like to start with the quiz sir yes the technical team can you start the poll question okay stop sharing sudipta can you please stop sharing yeah, just a message just yes sir. done so a start off with this clinical case which was of a 50 year old lady staff were presented to the emergency department history of diffuse abdominal pain for 3 days and this increased over the last 24 hours on admission her amylase lipase was normal liver function test was normal she underwent a ultrasound in the emergency department itself which showed a subserotal serosal uterine fibroid However, there was also an additional finding of a well-defined intraperitoneal cyst in the left upper quadrant, measuring 68 into 70 into 78 millimeters. Next slide, please. Now, uh, this is the two images. On the uh, one side, you have the CT scan image is showing a well-defined uh, cystic lesion arising from the tail of the pancreas. The MRI CP also shows a well-defined cystic lesion in the tail of pancreas. The unilocular cyst without any septations. the next question so now the question that we have is what is the possible diagnosis here are we dealing with a cirrhosis a mucinous cystic neoplasm a branched duct ipmn or is it a cystic degeneration of a neuroendocrine tumor or maybe even an intraductal papillary mucinous neoplasm now okay. this will be of for voting yeah can we have the poll now okay so everyone says it's a mucinous cystic neoplasm Let's yeah. see how it goes. Okay, then uh, you can Technip, please stop sharing your slide, and then uh, Sudipta, please share your slides. Yes, so, seeing the slides. So, okay, 
So just to give you a brief what pancreatic cystic lesions are, these are well-defined fluid filled lesions in the pancreas. They are often detected incidentally because of the high use of cross-sectional imaging for a myriad of reasons that we have today. If you look at the incidence of uh, or prevalence of pancreatic cystic lesion on MRI, the incidence is uh, around 16%, ranging from 13 to 18%. What is more interesting is that as the age in increases, the incidence of pancreatic cystic lesion keeps on increasing, and the highest is in the age group of more than eight years, where it's between 25 to 52 percent. Now, pancreatic cystic lesions can be non-neoplastic or neoplastic, and they are primarily classified into epithelial and non-epithelial. The non-neoplastic cysts include, which are epithelial origin, include simple cysts, retention cysts, congenital cysts, endometrial cysts, and the non-epithelial cysts include the cysts and the parasitic cysts. The neoplastic cyst includes IPMN, mucinous cystic neoplasm, cystic neoplasm, uh, solid pseudopapular epithelial neoplasm, or SPEN as we call it. And interesting, we also have some cysts which develop as a degeneration of solid tumors like the cystic neuroendocrine tumor or cystic ductal adenocarcinoma, asthma cell cyst adenomas, cystic teratomas, and mini non epithelial lymphogeoma and sarcoma are of non epithelial origin. Now, what is the relative incidence of these? Overall, overall majority of the cysts that we see in clinical practice are usually pseudocysts, developing as a consequence of acute pancreatitis. Uh, also, the, among the neoplastic cysts, more common are the IPMNs and mucinous cystic neoplasms and serocyst adenomas. Others constitute a very small percentage of the cystic lesions that we see in clinical practice. So the, for the purpose of today's discussion, I will restrict my talk primarily to the neoplastic ones, which is IPM and MCN, serocyst adenomas, SPEN, and cystic neuroendocrine tumor, and the non neoplastic ones, pseudocyst, which we see very commonly. So I'll go briefly into the morphology and presentation of each. If you look at a pseudocyst, the pseudocyst usually develops as a consequence of acute pancreatitis or an acute and chronic pancreatitis, not otherwise. And this can happen at any age. Sorry for the typo, they should be mucinous as a pseudocyst here. They are intra extra pancreatic, a wall contains fibrous or granulation tissue, well circumscribed, dark, rich uh, uh, fluid. The fluid is very dark, rich in pancreatic enzymes. Usually, you'll see a communication with the pancreatic duct and intervention only if the patient is symptomatic. However, the risk of malignancy in this are very, very low. Now, what is a serous adenoma? Serous adenomas are, on the other hand, are neoplastic cysts. They usually have an irregular uh, nature. They're composed of both microcysts, small cysts, as you can see here in the gross specimen, and macrocystic features. They're lumped by cuboidal epithelial cells and uh, have this small microcyst uh, within the uh, lesion. Now, most of the serocyst adenomas usually present in the fourth to sixth decade of life. 75% of them uh, ha ha are usually in females. They can be located anywhere in the pancreas, like head, body, or tail. And one interesting feature of serous adenoma is that 30% of them have central calcification. The internal structure consists of microcysts, which are small cysts, or they are larger cysts, and they have sometimes have a very honeycomb pattern. There is no communication with the main pancreatic duct in a serous adenoma. The external contour, as I discussed earlier, was lobulated, as you can see in this case itself. They do not contain mucin. Most of them are usually asymptomatic and may present with a mass lesion. And risk of malignancy in this group is nil. Now, what about mucinous cystic neoplasms? Mucinous cystic neoplasms are, are more commonly encountered in clinical practice. And as you can see, they're well-defined, can be unilocular, or have a septae in between. On gross specimens, they can be unilocular or sometimes even multilocular with septae in between. And they are lined by columnar epithelial cells, which are placed uh, with mildly atypia and a hyper uh, hypocellular epi subepithelial stroma. Now, what about MCNs? MCNs include 20% of surgically resected cystic lesions. So they are pretty common. And they usually occur in the four to six decade of life. The MCNs predominantly contain ovarian stroma, and therefore these uh, lesions are seen predominantly only in females, with the female to male ratio of 20 is to 1. They occur in the body and tail of the pancreas. Even in MCN, you can see calcification, but they are more towards the wall of, cal uh, of the cyst, which is called a carbinidia uh, calcification. Internal structure is like a cyst within a cyst. MPD communication is not there. They contain dense mucin. Now, if you look at the risk of malignancy, for less than per 3 centimeters, the risk is only 
half a leash is more than 3 cm, the risk is high. Some of them are asymptomatic and they present with pain, mass, or recurrent pancreatitis. Now, IPMN. This is the other group of uh, mucinous neoplasms, and they are of three different variants. One which happen only in the main duct, or called the main duct IPM. Ones which are in the side branch or branch duct IPMNs, and those which have a combination of both main and branch duct IPM. Now, this is a one post-operative specimen. Uh, uh, this, as you can see, there are multiple uh, proliferative lesions within the duct, a dilated duct with thick mucin. Histologically, they can be of four types, gastric type, intestinal type, pancreatobiliary type, or oncocytic type. Now, main duct IPMN usually occurs in the four to six uh, decades, and they have equal sex predominance. These lesions have been predominant the head uh, of the uh, uh, body, uh, head uh, of the pancreas. Now, the most interesting is that you can see as a diffuse or a segmental dilatation of MPD. But most importantly, there is no stricturing. So if you see a segmental dilatation of the main pancreatic duct or diffuse dilatation of main pancreatic without an obstructing calcification or stricture, please consider IPMN. The internal structure is like grape-like that we showed in the gross specimen. The main pancreatic duct communication is present in them. They can be multifocal. That means they can be in the head and also some folks that can also be in the body tail region. And they have mucin. The risk of malignancy in this group is very high. And this is present usually with frequent pancreatitis, back, back pain, weight loss, or diabetes mellitus. The other variant is branch duct IPMNs, which are the... Uh, this actually occur in the four to six decade of life and have equal sex distribution. Again, these also in the head. They usually present with a dilatation of a side branch of the pancreatic duct. The internal structure is similar to that of a main duct IPMN and communication with the main duct exists. This can also be multifocal and have mucin. The risk of malignancy in branch duct IPMN is much lower than that of a main duct IPMN. Now, this other variant, which has both brain and branch duct variants, their risk of malignancy is similar to that of a main duct IPM and should be treated as a main duct IPM. The other lesion that we would like to discuss here is the solid pseudo uh, papillary epithelial neoplasm, which is uh, also called a spin. This consists of an encapsulated solid cystic mass. So, it is predominantly a solid mass with cystic areas which generate basically because of hemorrhage within the lesion. As you can see, there is a decaying hemorrhage. They consist of poorly cohesive cells which detach and uh, arrange radially to form a pseudopapilla. Now, spin occurs usually in a younger age group, between 22nd to 3rd decades. Women are most often affected with spin. They occur in the body tail region and the internal structure is predominantly of a solid cystic, more solid and of a dense fibrous capsule. They do not communicate to the main pancreatic duct and the multiple, uh, they are usually solitary. They have a low risk of malignant, uh, uh, malignancy. Most of the patients with spin who came, younger women who come with spin present usually with a pain abdomen and an incidentally detected lesion. The cystic degeneration of solid uh, tumors, uh, predominantly the cystic pancreatic neuroendocrine tumors, it consists of almost 15% of all the peanuts that we see. And this usually occurs in the sixth decade, again in the body tail region of the pancreas. So one interesting uh, thing about cystic pancreatic neuroendocrine is that they have a very good blood supply. And therefore, the most important feature that we look for is the peripheral rim enhancement, as you can see here. So it's a thin rim of enhancement that you can see around the cystic lesion, which should raise the concern that we are dealing with the cystic pancreatic neuroendocrine tumor. The internal structure is more solid than cystic, and the MPD communication or mucin production does not exist. If you look at the risk of malignancy, there definitely has a high risk of malignancy, but it's much lower than that of solid neuroendocrine tumor. Most of the patients are asymptomatic. Rarely, they can present with recurrent pancreatitis. So WHO has classified this pancreatic cystic neoplasms into three major categories, benign, borderline malignant, borderline malignant, and malignant. And why it's important to know is for benign lesions, you do not need surgery, you do not need surveillance. Borderline lesions require surveillance, whereas malignant lesions require surgery. Serous cyst uh, cystic neoplasms can be grouped into two groups, serous cyst adenoma or serous cyst adenocarcinoma. Adenocarcinoma is malignant and therefore requires surgery, whereas uh, uh, benign lesions do not require any follow-up or sur sur uh, surgery. Mucinous cystic neoplasm are again into three grades, mucinous cyst adenoma, mucinous cystic neoplasm, cyst adenocarcinoma.
and the mcn primarily is the one which is classified into again low grade uh, dysplasia high grade dysplasia and these are classified as borderline biopasms and may be uh, considered for surveillance or surgery depending on the clinical context Business cyst adenocarcinoma should be considered for surgery if the patient is stable. IPMNs can be classified as low grade and high grade, and low grade are usually borderline type. High grade is carcinoma in situ, and they can be put up for surveillance. But whenever there is an invasive carcinoma or malignancy, one should consider surgery followed by post-operative surveillance. Similarly, for spend, because they are symptomatic, many of them are offered surgery, and uh, spend can be borderline or pseudo papillary carcinoma, which is malignant. So now I'll come briefly to the diagnosis of uh, uh, pancreatic cystic lesions. Now, there are certain challenges with the diagnosis of pancreatic cystic lesion. This include primarily the lesions are heterogeneous, they are variable symptoms, or patient may be asymptomatic and the lesion will be detected incidentally. There's the evolving nature of the disease. The patient can progress from board, uh, benign to borderline malignant to malignant and therefore requires surveillance. There are limitations in the imaging that we will discuss shortly that we may not have a thorough imaging uh, thing. There are challenges with cytological analysis and molecular diagnosis. And of course, multiple societies have put up guidelines and there's a significant variability in the guidelines. So what are the goals of evaluation? The goals of evaluation is primarily to discriminate between benign, borderline, malignant, and malignant. The idea is to not to offer surgery to patients who are benign because that would increase the risk and morbidities. So benign lesions like serocyst or serocyst adenomas do not require any surveillance. However, borderline lesions like mus uh, mucinous cystic neoplasm or IPMN require surveillance or surgery. And malignant lesions like where there is cancer or invasive cancer require surgery. And the goal of evaluation is primarily to discriminate between these three entities because that would determine our treatment strategy. Now, how to go around this diagnosis? The steps is to first assess the symptoms. If the patient is overtly symptomatic, then we know we are dealing with a dangerous lesion. If you rule out that that's what we're dealing with is not a serosis. And it's very easy to rule out a serosis. Usually there'll be history of uh, abdominal pain, there'll be history of uh, pancreatitis, there'll be, ab uh, there'll be or background history of chronic pancreatitis. And discriminate between mucinous versus non-mucinous, identify high-risk features, and determine the surveillance and treatment option. So we first start off with cross-sectional imaging, and there are certain elements of cross-sectional imaging which we should ensure must be reported. And this includes the cyst morphology and location, the cyst size. We know that cysts less than 10 millimeters harbor a low risk of malignancy and therefore do not require surgery or any form of surveillance. We should identify the relationship to the main pancreatic duct, presence of worrisome features or high risk stigmata, multiplicity of the lesions, whether there's uh, multi uh, multiple lesions, and of course, growth on follow-up imaging. Amongst the imaging modalities, MRI and MRCP is the preferred modality. And MRI is preferred imaging modality because it has a high accuracy for identifying the specific type of pancreatic cystic neoplasm. It has got a superior soft tissue contrast resolution. Accuracy is 89% in detecting solid mural nodules. And low, but however, there's a problem with MRI. It cannot detect uh, calcification, they're motion artifacts. And in certain situations, CT scan is required, especially if there's calcification to determine whether you're dealing with parenchymal, neural, central calcification, and especially when you're trying to dis discriminate between a pancreatic cirrhosis from a pancreatic cystic neoplasm. Again, malignant PC, uh, uh, pancreatic cystic neoplasm, we need a CT scan to determine the vascular involvement, the peritoneal involvement, and the risk of metastatic disease. And if there's a suspicion of post-operative recurrence, we prefer to do CT scan. So just to summarize on our table, what are the features on cross-sectional imaging? And I've highlighted red, which, hi uh, which basically are the hallmarks of it. Now, if you look at location, most of the pancreatic cystic neoplasms can occur in the body tail or everywhere, except for IPMS, which are predominantly in the head and uncinate region of the pancreas. If you look at morphology, uh, Mason cystic neoplasm, as we discussed, are unilocular or macrocystic. IPMN have a cyst with mural nodules. May a microcystic, uh, uh, serous cyst adenomas are microcystic or can be macrocystic, whereas PEN and uh, uh, cystic degeneration neuroendocrine tumors are solid cystic. If you look at the risk MPD communication, then only IPMN and serous have, uh, have communication with the main duct. 
The main duct size is normal in most circumstances, except for an IPMN, which can be dilated more than 5 mm, or in cirrhosis, where this uh, duct may be dilated or may be irregular because in the setting of chronic pancreatitis. If you look at the cyst wall, the enhancement of the cyst wall is typically seen in cystic neuroendocrine tumor. And if you look at calcification, then only two of them have a calcification, and that also in two different sites. Mucinous cystic neoplasm have calcification in the wall, which are in the form of curvilinear calcification, and serous cystic adenoma have central calcification, 30 to 40 percent. And multifocal nature of the disease, only IPMNs are multifocal. So, coming from cross sectional imaging to endoscopy. If you look at endoscopy, then on the side being endoscopy, in IPMN, we can see sometimes uh, mucus extruding out of the major papilla. And this is called the fish mouth papilla. This is seen almost in 50% of main duct IPMN. And once if you see this, it's almost a 91% specificity for diagnosis for in main duct IPMN. And if you're doing it in EUS and you see this, you probably don't need to proceed further with any EUS. Large lesions can deform the D1 lesion and occasionally they can be a fistula formation. But endoscopy beyond diagnosis of fish mouth papilla doesn't have much value in the diagnostic algorithm of cystic neoplasms. Therefore, we look at something more advanced than endoscopy, and that is endoscopic ultrasound. The primary purpose of endoscopic ultrasound is to delineate the cyst size, the, to characterize the cyst wall, identify septations and calcifications, look at mural nodules, relationship of the cyst with the adjacent organs, vasculature, communication with MPD and measurement of MPD diameter. Now, different societies have given different guidelines of when to do uh, EUS. Now, if you look at the IAP and the ACG guidelines, there are some commonalities. The commonalities include, if the cyst is more than three centimeters, you have an MPD which is more than five millimeter, or if there's an abrupt change in the caliber of M MPD with an uh, upstream atrophy, then definitely we should consider EUS. In addition to that, the, both those uh, uh, guidelines also mention two other things. That is, one is if there's presence of mural uh, nodules or there's an elevated CA99. But the latest European uh, uh, 2018 guidelines are very simple. And, this, uh, and they highlight that we should do US whenever the diagnosis is unclear and the results are expected to change the clinical management of the patient. However, if the diagnosis is clear and the patient is operable, then there's no point in doing an EUS and one should proceed with surgery straight on. So, how does morphology help us? If you look at the cyst wall properties, you look at calcification in the wall, then more likely we're dealing with mucinous cystic neoplasm. With the cyst characteristics, then uh, serous cyst adenomas are microcystic or macrocystic pattern, but mucinous cystic neoplasm have oligocystic uh, or usually oligocystic or have large cysts. If you look at the internal characterizations, we can look at the septa. At the thickened septa, there's a high risk for neoplasm, and you can consider mucinous cystic neoplasm. Presence of neural nodules, which highlight the either for in IPM and MCM. Solid component, if you see, then more likely you're dealing with a cystic neuroendocrine tumor, spent on a malignant variant of IPM and MCM. If you look at for communication with the pancreatic duct, then only two of them communicate, that is IPM and cirrhosis. And if you look at associated cystic masses, you can consider is a cystic neuroendocrine tumor. And very rarely, sometimes the pancreatic ductal endocarcinoma also necrosis and produces a cystic appearance. So what are the features of malignancy at EUS? The features of malignancy at EUS include a large cyst, more than 3 centimeters, presence of mural nodules, more than 5 millimeters. If there's septal thickness, if the thickened septa more than 2.5 millimeter, one should consider a possibility of malignancy. If there's a cyst producing a bile duct obstruction or a dilated MPD, one should consider malignancy in the patient. And if you're so, so the one thing that I've been talking now for the last couple of slides have been neural nodules. Now, what are neural nodules? Neural nodules are formed in the wall of the cystic neoplasm, predominantly seen in IPM in the form of a thickening of the wall or a form blip. Now, the problem with neural nodules is that sometimes, even in IPM, which secretes so much am amount of mucin, that it's very difficult to discriminate between inspissated mucin and neural uh, nodule. EUS helps in certain extent because in EUS, if you look at the echogenicity, the neural nodules have a hyperechoic, iso a hyperechoic with irregular margin, whereas mucinous lesions are usually hypoechoic and have a hyperechoic ring. 
but these are very subjective and maybe sometimes difficult to discern then comes in the role of an advanced modality of us called the contrast harmonic us the contrast harmonic us as you can see in the right upper quadrant going on for another cystic leoplasia with small microcystic patterns uh, it involves injection of an iv contrast which is shown of you which is a ultrasound contrast now once we inject the iv contrast within 25 to 30 seconds you can see an enhancement of the uh, of the vascularity and this is in pancreatic cystic neoplasm its primary role is in discriminating neural nodule from mucin and nothing beyond it as you can see this is all uh, taking a vascular uh, vascular area so this is probably not mu uh, mucus more likely to doing with a nodule out there and presence of it should consider FNA. Now, if you look at it, the full sensitivity of our contrast harmonic uh, EUS to discriminate between neural nodule from mucin has been to the tune of 97% and specificity is 90%. As in this case, you can see there's a, uh, there's a small uh, blob here, which possibly is a neural nodule, but on contrast harmonic, it does not take up any contrast. And so this is more likely to be a mucin plug. Then of course, EUS gives us the opportunity of puncturing the cyst, aspirating the content, and assessing the content. And in the content that we are primarily concerned about is to discriminate between mucinous and non mucinous And a very simple way to discriminate between mucinous and mucinous is a string test. The string test involves either taking two slides, putting a drop of the aspirate into two slides and separating the slide, or putting it between two gloved hands and separating it out. Now, if you see a string of more than one centimeter of length, which stands for more than one second, then this is a positive string test. Uh, string test, and the sensitivity of this to identify mucinous lesions is fifty-eight percent, but the specificity is ninety-five percent. So this is a very specific uh, test to identify if this is uh, aspirate and diagnose mucinous cystic lesion. Once we aspirate the content, we can send for multiple analysis. And one of the analysis that we commonly do is the carcinoembryonic antigen, or CEA. Now, there has been no well-defined cutoff. But however, we know that if CEA is more than 192, it very well discriminates between mucinous from non-mucinous. And sensitivity of this is 75%, specificity is 84%. CEA less than 5 nanograms per ml, you definitely know this is not a mucinous lesion. And CEO, uh, CA more than 800 is definitely mucinous. So the range of CA is very wide. From 192 to 800, it can be anywhere. And anything more than 192, one should suspect that we're dealing probably with the mucinous lesion. A more easy way to determine um, a mucinous lesion is to look at the glucose content of the fluid aspirate. And this can be done in the endoscopy room itself with a simple glucometer. If the intracystic glucose is less than 50 mg per deciliter, then it discriminates between mucinous and non-mucinous. And this performs better than CA of 192. A meta-analysis of 36 studies show that glucose performs better than CA and a higher sensitivity than CA in discriminating mucinous from non-mucinous lesion. So mucinous lesions have very low intracystic glucose. What about molecular markers? These are the ones that are used, and I'll discuss the other ones a bit later. Now, within the cyst, now we have next generation sequencing available, and we can look for oncogenes within the cyst, and these include the genus and the keras. And a meta analysis of six studies have shown that genus and keras have a high sensitivity for diagnosing IPMN and a specificity as well an accuracy of 97%. Whereas genus and keras can also discriminate mucinous cystic lesions. And the space sensitivity is same as uh, CEA, but the accuracy is higher. So definitely, genus and keras, if you look at it, it has a very high sensitivity and specificity of diagnosis in IPM. If you're inside the cyst, we can always aspirate the content and examine for cytology. The problem with cytology is that the aspiration is usually a posse cellular, and therefore, to get a correct diagnosis sometimes is difficult. The sensitivity of specificity of aspirated fluid is 54% and 93% respectively. So it is definitely a poorly sensitive test. But if you have good cytology, then you can easily diagnose even solid pseudopapillary tumors or, or a neuroendocrine tumor. Now, an addition to this has been the use of through the needle biopsy forceps. Now, through the needle biopsy forceps, it can be used to biopsy either the septa, the neural nodule, to increase the sensitivity. Now, it is done by passing a forceps through a 19-gauge needle into the pseudocyst. 
or sorry, into the cystic lesion and either biopsying the neural nodule or the septum. Now, diagnostic accuracy of this technique is 78%, space sensitivity is 80%, and space specificity is 97%. And a mean of three, three passes is required to improve the accuracy. However, this has come in with uh, risk factors, including bleeding from the cyst wall, as well as from uh, the form of pancreatitis. So at EUS, what do we, how can we discriminate different lesions? So again, I'm not going into the details of morphology and ductal communication, and but uh, I just go into the viscosity. IPMN, MCN are predominantly viscous lesion. And serous uh, uh, you get a thin cloud lesion. Uh, so solid pseudopapillary tumors usually get bio, uh, uh, bloody. In cystic, uh, uh, cystic neuroendocrine tumors, the uh, viscosity is variable. And furosis, the viscosity is very, very thin. Most of the uh, lesions, the aspirate is generally clear, except for serous cystadenoma, which is occasionally bloody, and in the uh, solid pseudopapillary tumors, which can be bloody. The cyst fluid amylase is something we use, and in IPM, the cyst fluid amylase can be high because of the ductal communication, and, uh, and in steurosis, obviously, it is high. But in all other circumstances, cyst, uh, cyst fluid amylase is low. CA is elevated in mucinous lesions and low in non-mucinous lesions, and the high is more than 192 nanograms per uh, ml. Cyst glucose is lower in mucinous lesions like IPMN and MCN. And molecular markers like Keras and Genas adequately IP identify IPMN and Keras for MCN. I'll talk about this a bit later with other molecular markers that we can use, include the VHL and the CTNNB1. So now, as we discussed in the quiz, so we decided to do the EUS of this lesion, and EUS showed a large unilocular cyst with a thick content. It was large, well-defined, 8 to 7 centimeters. The fluid was mucinous. String test was positive. The glucose content within the cyst was 16 milligrams per deciliter, and the CEA was 10,271 nanograms per mm. So I think we had a 100% uh, diagnosis of MCN, and this particular case underwent a distal pancreatomy and a splenectomy, and that showed a mucinous cystic neoplasm with a low-grade dysplasia. So I'll come to the newer diagnostic tools which can improve the diagnosis. and. With uh, so, can we take can we take the break and can take the question? Is if Dr. Matthew Philip is also agreed? Sure, sure, sure. Please or do. This. How, how many more slides on diagnostic tools? Uh, I think we have around five. Uh, all these four to four slides. Sir. I think you know after diagnosis we can take up the questions. Okay. Rajesh, is that fine? Uh, yes, sir. Yes, sir. Shall I proceed? Yeah, you proceed. After five minutes, we'll take up the questions. Yeah. So the newer diagnostic tools that we have include confocal laser microscopy, advanced molecular markers, artificial intelligence, and I'll briefly touch upon the role of pancreatoscopy here. Now, confocal laser endomicroscopy is a new modality. It has been in focus for a long time now. However, because of cost constraints and imaging limitation, this has not gained that much popularity. The technique involves administration of a contrast solution consisting of fluorescent dye, fluorescent sodium intravenously, and a probe is inserted through the 19 gauge needle into the uh, cystic lesion. And as you can see on the left side, this is a superficial vascular network. As you can see, serous uh, cystadenoma is quite pathognomonic of serous cystadenoma. And even in IPMN, without having to do much aspiration, I think you can diagnose papillary projections in the IPMN. So it's an additional tool. Significant cost constraints that has limited its uh, is widespread use. Now, as we discussed the molecular markers, recent advances in molecular marker uh, and, and uh, next gen generation sequencing has even enabled us to do further markers. And one of these markers is VHL gene mutations. A VHL gene mutation is predominantly seen in serous cyst adenoma, and the sensitivity of this is seventy one percent. Specificity is hundred percent. The other one is MEN1 and the loss of uh, heterozygosity genes. It is can be seen predominantly in PNET with a sensitivity of 68% and specificity of 98%. And the cyst fluid can be sent for these molecular markers. The more interesting one is this four combination, EP53, MAT4, CTNNB1, and mTOR. Now, we know the genus mutation helps us identify uh, 
IPMN as we discussed in the previous slide. When you combine DNAS mutation and this spore uh, in a panel itself, the sensitivity of identifying advanced neoplasia rises to 88% and specificity is 98%. So just addition of this four molecular markers to the genome significantly improve the sensitivity and specificity. So as the time evolves, we'll have more and more markers coming in for cystoid analysis, and this is a very exciting field now. Of course, now artificial intelligence has come in, and since 2019, artificial intelligence has been used in the evaluation of pancreatic diseases. And AI can help stratify pancreatic cystic uh, lesions, differentiate between different types of pancreatic cystic lesions. The different mod uh, mo uh, models of uh, AI go deep, uh, deep learning. And including, uh, this is a retrospective study of 50 IPMNs with a malignancy in 23 patients. Deep learning algorithm was used to analyze 3,790 US images. Interesting thing is that, with the deep learning algorithm, the accuracy of diagnosis and malignancy was 94%. However, on the human side, the accuracy was 68% even when in the presence of mu uh, neural nodules there. So AI is going to come in shortly in a great way, and as it becomes more readily available, it will be a useful tool in the diagnosis and evaluation of pancreatic cystic lesion. I'll just go briefly into another interesting area, which is the spyglass phalangoscopy. Now, spyglass phalangoscopy, as you all know, has been used routinely for assessment of the bile duct. In the pancreas, when we assess it, it has been used for intrapancreastoscopy. Now, as we discussed earlier also, the IPMNs can be multifocal, and therefore, in IPMN, it is important to understand the extent of the disease and to identify skip lesion. So, as you can see, in this is a spyglass image of uh, uh, of an IPM. You can see this nice grape-like clusters within the on the wall of the cyst and the, uh, within the wall of the duct. And this is the duct lumen here. Now, the extent to which IPM pancreatoscopy, uh, uh, intra pancreatoscopy altered diagnosis is to the extent of thirteen to sixty-two uh, uh, percent, alt and also helped in decision making whether the patient goes for a, only a ripples or a total pancreatoscopy. The features include uh, of malignancy include if you see a post mucosa, friable mucosa, tumor vessels. But this comes up with complications and the risk of complications of uh, pancreatitis is to the tune of 10%, which is fairly high. So we can stop here. Dr. Rajesh, can you please take up the questions? And uh, yeah. just all the uh, people are listening to it to uh, put your questions in the chat box. We will try to answer all, and after 10 minutes, we will restart the meeting and uh, we'll continue with the treatment. Dr. Dajish, so, please. Thank you, Dr. Sudipto, for the excellent overview of the how to approach the cystic lesion of the pancreas. And uh, if I look at the chat box, there's a question from Dr. Philip, Dr. Matthew Philip. There are situations where one can have multiple cysts in the pancreas, like associated with the polycystic disease. Von Hippel Endo syndrome. What are those cysts? Should we intervene those cysts? How to evaluate those patients? Okay, that's a very interesting question, actually. And uh, in VHL, as you know, you can the whole pancreas can be replaced by multiple cysts. Most often than not, these cysts are usually simple cysts, and even when they progress, they would be a serous cyst adenoma. Likelihood of that having any other altered malignant cyst is unlikely. However, there is a small percentage of patients with VHL who can develop neuroendocrine tumors, solid neuroendocrine tumors of the pancreas, and therefore the surveillance is indicated. Otherwise, for routine cysts that we see in VHL, we do not require routine surveillance of these because they are just simple cysts of the pancreas. Okay. And the next question is from Dr. Harsha. How to manage a cystic lesion which is less than 2 cm? Okay. I'll just come to the diagnostic algorithm as we come further. Is that okay, Dr. Uh, I think I, I think, uh, yeah. Because we can discuss this in the next slide itself. That will be helpful. Another very pertaining question in India, we have a potential to have a parasitic, parasitic cystic in the lesion in the pancreas like hydrated cyst. So how do you differentiate that this is a parasitic hydrated cyst or it is a cystic neoplasm of the pancreas? 
Uh, that's a very interesting question. I haven't clinically found many such patients, but we do we do hear of occasional this that you can see parasitic cysts. Now, most of the parasitic cysts when we do an EUS, I usually anechoinate for the major part, or you can see floating membranes within the cyst, and uh, so that's what you see: floating membranes, daughter cyst, and you do not see septae, you do not see neural nodules. Okay. So the next question is by Dr. Lal Krishna. The management strategy of IPM and which guidelines I think you are going to cover so we can wait we for can on that on that. And Dr. Nanda Kumar, what are the chances of pancreatic main IPM and communicating also with the biliary duct? How frequently it is seen? Um, so main, uh, well, main duct I, man, what are the chances of communication with the main bile duct? How frequently it is seen? We have seen a fair number of I IPMs even in our own personal series in the hospital, and we haven't seen many main duct IPMs communicating with the bile duct except when there's a large cyst, and it forms a fistulizing communication to the uh, uh, into the duodenum. And it's I would say it's very infrequent, but I do not know the exact number. Uh, Rajesh, you Sujit. might give some. Yeah, two questions which will be very relevant in the day-to-day -day clinical practice. We have discussed MRI, we have discussed CT scan, we have done endoscopic ultrasound, and so many tests in endoscopic ultrasound, right from glucose to CA to the molecular markers, now the advanced molecular marker, and we have done the Boris 5 biopsy forcep, and there is a uh, microscopic examination. So this, these all these tests make a lot of money involved in this. A very, simple, a very simple question. Any patient who comes to you with a cystic lesion of the pancreas, what is the best clinical strategy to give a reasonably good answer to the patient? Because in spite of doing all tests, the accuracy doesn't go more than 70 to 80 percent. Still 20 percent of the patient we don't know. So which is the in Indian scenario where the cost is a constraint, which all tests you will recommend to the patient? Number one, which test you are going to recommend? When you are going to recommend? When you tell the patient there is no need to do anything? Because a patient who has an advanced, 90 year patient who has an advanced cystic lesion, then there's no point in doing the surveillance. So I want to know a brief message from you how to investigate and up to what level you are going to investigate these patients. So I'll put it very simply, Dr. Rajesh. If a cyst is less than 10 millimeters, one does not need to do anything in this group of individuals. And the best can imaging I, model. Can I ask one question? The main duct IPM and of 10 millimeter. No, I'm not. I'm talking about cyst. I'm not talking oh. of the main duct. IPM. I'm talking about cyst per se. Your first question was pertaining to the cyst per se. I'm talking about. I mean, that IPM is a different story altogether. Because at 10 millimeters, you're worried about malignancy. But I'm talking about in, in any other circumstances, when you come across an incidentally detected cyst in the pancreas, if the patient has a history of pancreatitis, more likely you are dealing with a pseudocyst. And if the patient is asymptomatic, you do not need to do anything in this group of individuals. If the patient has a, uh, has a cyst which is less than 10 millimeters, diagnosed on cross-section, good quality cross-section imaging like an MRI, there's no other solid lesions anywhere, then we do not need to do anything in this group of patients. That sorts the problem. The problem per se lies in two factors, cysts which are between one to four centimeters and beyond four centimeters. As we say, in cysts which are more than four centimeters, I'll come to the diagnostic algorithm when I'm talking this, is that when you're talking to cysts more than four centimeters, you're dealing with probably a neoplastic cyst, and that needs to be examined more thoroughly and determined whether you're dealing with a mucinous, non mucinous, or if there's a malignant potential to it. Between the two to four centimeters, one to four centimeters is where there's a lot of uh, variability as to whether one should do an EUS, should do an MRI, and what the surveillance interval is. So I'll touch upon those areas briefly, Dr. Rajesh, in the next few slides, if that's okay with you. Okay. Now, a few more questions, because in the era of endoscopic ultrasound, everybody is doing the endoscopic ultrasound, and when they find a cyst, they puncture the cyst. What is your message to the young generation 
when you are doing it, first of all, will you do endoscopic ultrasound in all cyst? If you are doing endoscopic ultrasound, will you puncture all cyst? And when you are puncturing, what precautions you are going to take? If you can guide the youngster about this. So I'll put it very simply, Dr. Pradesh. EUS is not required for all cystic lesions of the pancreas. That's number one. Let's take it first. EUS is required only when the intervention is going to change the management of that individual, especially an EUS FNAC, because it comes with the caveat risk of leakage, pancreatitis, cyst infection. So one should be very careful once before we puncture a cyst. Just a random puncture is not necessary. A good quality MRCP gives enough information as to determine the nature of the cyst. So even if you ask me where I will do it and where I will not do it, I will not do it if the patient is not, uh, not fit for surgery, not planned for any therapy, or the cyst is determined to and the AP operation. However, I will use size of the cyst. There is a cyst which is uh, more than 3 centimeters. MRI shows possibility, the septations, the thickened septation. Definitely, I will go in and assist with the EUS. Okay. Dr. Sudipto, the question from Dr. Naveen Mehla. What is the role of CA 19.9 in the cyst field for diagnosis of malignancy? Does it have any role? No, no role. Okay. One another question from my side. When you aspirate the fluid and you only aspirate one ml of the fluid, which test you would suggest that give the best information about the cystic lesion? Don't need to do anything. Just take the needle, put it to your glucometer mix, which is available in the room, and get the uh, glucose test. That will clinch the diagnosis in 90% of the patients. Absolutely right. Now, there's another question from Dr. Karan. When to suspect other differential other than pseudocyst for cystic lesion with a history of recurrent acute pancreatitis? Meaning that patient has a history of recurrent acute pancreatitis. When do you feel that this is not pseudocyst, this is a cystic lesion of the pancreas? Good question. I think this is a very relevant question. And that's primarily, if anyone who comes in with an, a recurrent acute pancreatitis beyond the fifth decade of life, please look for a neoplastic surge. And if there's a cystic lesion in the in a person with a uh, with an elderly person with recurrent acute pancreatitis, I would definitely assess the cyst for a mucinous cystic lesion or for a IPMN. The doc question from Dr. S. K. Sharma from New Delhi: What is the prevalence of regional lymphadenopathy in IPCN? IPMN is there is any role of PET scan in suspected malignant lesion? Do you PET. do advice scan? No, we do not do PET. FDG PET uptake of cystic lesions have been very poor and therefore I did not bring it into discussion. Uh, the prevalence of uh, regional lymphadenopathy in IPCNs, I am probably not aware of the exact number, so I may not be able to quote a number on that. But if there is regional lymphadenopathy, then we are suspecting a malignant transformation and that patient should be offered surgery. And the question is another question from Dr. Sivesh Akur from Indore. What is the median time to develop pre-malignant to malignant lesion in various pre-malignant cystic lesion? I think it's a very uh, important question. Yeah. The, it's important in the sense that that will give you the timeline and understand why the guidelines are coming as such. If the, the risk of malignant transformation is within the first three two years of the diagnosis of the cystic lesion. The after three years, if the cyst has not progressed, then unlikely the cyst is going to progress ever, and therefore the risk comes down. So therefore, the surveillance recommendation that we'll talk about shortly from ECG also clearly says that uh, you should do evaluation only for the first three years since the cyst has been diagnosed. Dr. Matthew, we have a time to discuss questions or we should no, no, start? No, I think, I think, no, I think we should resume for the talk now. We'll take the questions at the end. So I think okay. we'll uh, start the presentation now. Can I just start, sir? Yeah. 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 Thank you. Thank you. Yes. Sorry. So now that we have a cyst, we have to discriminate between those cysts which have a high risk stigmata and those which have features which are worrisome. Now, high risk stigmata include when you have an enhancing neural nodule of more than five millimeter, we have obstructive jaundice because of the cyst. 
in the head of pancreas that is the cyst is occluding the duct or the MPD is more than 10 millimeters. These are features of high-risk stigmata. But there are features which should one make us worried that we are dealing with a malignant cystic neoplasm. And if the cyst is more than 3 centimeters, again, if they're in mural nodules, but they're small mural nodules, MPD caliber is between 5 to 9 millimeters. If there's an abrupt change in the MPD caliber with a distal atrophy of the gland, one should consider a IPMN possibility there. If there's a thickened cyst, what? <clears throat> The IPMN rapidly is growing over the two years of follow-up as discussed earlier. <clears throat> One should consider um, uh, um, uh, um, uh, what is some feature. The, the blood CA99 has been used by certain guidelines and I leave it here because that has not been particularly helpful. But most of the guidelines, some of the guidelines actually recommend that looking at CA99 and the CA99 is more than 37, that one should consider this is a worrisome feature and evaluate the cyst more extensively. And of course, as we discussed, lymphadenopathy is a worrisome feature. Now, the multiple guidelines for the purpose of the talk, I have uh, I've just restricted to two major guidelines. And these include the IAP guideline of 2017 or the International Consensus Guidelines and the European Guidelines of 2018. Now, if, the, if there's an absolute indication for treating a patient in IAP guidelines, is an NPD more than 10 millimeters. If the enhanced neural nodules, jaundice or a solid mass, as in the iris feature. Similarly, the European more than 10 millimeters is a positive side to treat, definitely. However, there is a variability in when there is a relative indication for surgery. The relative indications include when there is a growth at 5 millimeters per uh, year, if the cyst has more than 3 millimeters centimeters, if there's a background history of acute pancreatitis, thicken and enhancing wall lymphadenopathy, or abrupt change in MPD caliber, as was the uh, original uh, uh, some features. So these are relative indications for uh, treatment. So what is the treatment options in, uh, in a pancreatic uh, cystic neoplasms? For lesions in the head of the gland, most of the surgeons prefer to offer a Whipple procedure. Those in the tail of the gland underwe a distal pancreatectomy. Occasionally, we have IPMNs which are multifocal or, or have a diffusely dilated duct right up to the tail, and these uh, patients undergo a total pancreatectomy. Now, I'm not going into the surgical details of this, though this is beyond the scope of this talk. So I'm going to touch briefly on the endoscopic options that are available for therapy. And one of the endoscopic options for therapy is called the EVS guided cyst ablation. The U.S. guided cyst ablation can be done using absolute alcohol, absolute alcohol combined with uh, paclitic cell or radio frequency ablation, which is a heat ablation. The primary indications for this are that cyst should be a benign cyst of two to maximum two to four centimeters, unilocular, oligolocular, and there should not be any communication with the main pancreatic duct because if you inject contra, uh, if you inject alcohol and there's an MPD communication, high risk the patient will develop pancreatitis. The problem, uh, the success rate of this has been with ethanol and paclitaxel has been the highest to the tune of 70%, ethanol alone 32%, but RFA has had a poor success rate. The adverse events in this procedure is high to the tune of 14%, and the more common ones include pancreatitis, intracystic bleeding, ductal leak, and fever. So this is still an area of active investigation and not currently considered a current standard of care. So once a patient undergoes operation, how do we follow up this patient? Now, the, if the operation shows a, a evidence of invasive cancer or high-grade dysplasia or IPMN, then we need a MRI at two yearly intervals. If there is no such feature, but uh, uh, we look for a family history of cancer. If there's a family history of cancer, we need MRI two yearly interval. However, if there's no family history of cancer, then the patient does not require any further surveillance. Now, I'll touch briefly on the surveillance of uh, pancreatic cystic lesions and uh, why we discussed this earlier as to how we go about surveillance. Now, there are different guidelines that put up different uh, algorithms for uh, surveillance, and therefore, it's important to understand where they are coming from. The ACG guideline of 2018 clearly states that for lesions which are 1 to 2 centimeters in size, we can do an MRI at one year interval for two years and then MRI every two years. For lesions of two to four centimeters, if MRI at the date six monthly 
for three years, MRI or EUS at six monthly, uh, for three years, followed by MRI or EUS at one year interval for additional three. So, the, as discussed in the question earlier also, the highest risk of malignancy is in the first three years of follow-up, and therefore the intensity of follow-up is also higher during this period. The European guidelines slightly differ, and they are very simplistic to follow, that any cyst which is more than four centimeters, we should operate the cyst. Uh, a cyst of one, one to four centimeters require, um, uh, uh, for in the first year, we can do MRI or EUS at a six-month interval along with PA-99. And if the patient, if the cyst does not progress, then after that, it is at one year, for, uh, one year interval for the next four years. So now I'll just give briefly the treatment algorithm that we follow at CMC, and this may not be generalizable elsewhere. So if you detect an incidental cystic leopardism, what we ask for is a history of pancreatitis. If there's a history of pancreatitis, we evaluate for a serious history. If there's no history of pancreatitis, we assess the, uh, and, we, and the patient is very, very overtly symptomatic, then there are two possibilities. If the patient is symptomatic, then the patient should be offered surgery. If the patient is not symptomatic and their presence of high risk uh, features like an enhancing nodule duct more than 10 millimeters, then also the patient should be offered surgery. However, if there is no high risk features, no, no enhancing nodule or duct is less than 10 millimeters, but they are, we look for worrisome features. The worrisome features include this more than 3 centimeters, thickened duct wall, MPD of 5 to 9 millimeters, non-enhancing nodule, an abrupt change in ab uh, pancreatic duct diameter uh, with a discal atrophy. In this, if it is there, then we offer EUS and we follow the uh, European guidelines of six monthly and then yearly. If no, then the patient is offered for surveillance. So just to summarize, pancreatic cystic lesions are common not all of them have a malignancy and therefore risk of malignancy is relatively low. MRI is a recommended imaging modality for pancreatic cystic neoplasm. EUS should be considered only when diagnosis is unclear and the results will alter the management of the patient. Surgery should be considered when the high risk features and surveillance is recommended for cysts of more than one centimeter. Thank, Thank you, Dr. Thank you, Dr. Sudipto, for the excellent lecture and giving the overview, both diagnosis as well as treatment. Now, uh, I think uh, we can discuss about the questions in the chat box. Yeah. So, yeah, so there's a question from Dr. Lal Krishna, management strategy for IPMN, which guidelines have to follow? So as we discussed earlier also, these uh, guidelines have been a bit of a uh, controversy because there are multiple guidelines and things. For us, we follow the uh, European guidelines, which are very, very straightforward. If the duct is dilated, more than 10 millimeters, if the high risk feature, patient should be offered surgery. Otherwise, patient can be followed up as per the size and interval recommended. Okay, so there's a uh, house TB prevalence as a pancreatic cyst. Pretty interesting question because uh, we know that uh, now we see a few of the pancreatic uh, leashes with pancreatic uh, tuberculosis, and uh, most of the cysts that we see in relationship to the acute uh, with the pancreas have been lymph nodes which are centrally necrosed rather than the uh, uh, pancreatic TB per se. So I actually would not know the exact prevalence of the of the TB with cystic lesions, but however. Whatever cysts we have seen in our clinical practice in the setting of TB and pancreas have been lymph nodes which have necrocentrally. So just to uh, add Dr. on... Dr. Rajesh, you have, and if you have any uh, comments on that. Yeah, yeah. So just to add with Dr. Sudipto, this is very absolutely true. Majority of the patients the lymph nodal mass at the peripancreatic lesion. But I have published a paper of, I think, 18 cases of pancreatic mass lesion. A young guy presented with a fever and there's a mass in the head of the pancreas. On CT scan, there was a suspicion of malignancy, and when you do an endoscopic ultrasound, 
it is a solid cystic lesa so that is one of the presentation of the tb of the pancreas and another question from dr matthew philip precautions for cyst aspiration fnb in the cystic degeneration of the net what is your view point dr sudipto okay i'll this i'll divide the question into two halves if you permit one is the precaution of any cyst when you're doing an fnc mm -hmm. before 2020 we were all giving iv antibiotics for doing any fnacs of pancreatic cystic lesion since then there has been a publication from dr shams group which showed that uh, iv antibiotics are primarily not very helpful in uh, preventing infections in pancreatic cystic lesions and the risk of infections are very low however in uh, we are working in india where many of the centers do reuse the fna needles so if there is a history of fna reuse then you better to give antibiotics otherwise we probably in our center for example we do not use and so therefore we do not use iv antibiotics for cystic lesion that's one now neuroendocrine tumors are a different ball game altogether one they are extremely vascular risk of bleeding is very high and therefore many at times we would uh, try to avoid a uh, uh, what you call fnab of a neuroendocrine tumor the thing with the neuroendocrine tumor many a times in fact actually we should have this which is of course beyond the scope of the discussion contrast harmonic eus gives a better delineation of the neuroendocrine and the vascularity within and that is quite helpful in diagnosis without having to puncture with the needle per se so in our center we preferably try to avoid fnacs of neuroendocrine tumors especially which have got high amount of vascularity dr sudipto another uh, technical questions suppose a patient has a three cyst in the pancreas one large cyst which has a three cyst in the pancreas that's number one which cyst you are going to puncture number second patient has a mural nodule and the fluid which first you are going to target first you are going to target the mural nodule or you are going to aspirate the fluid and then you are going to target the uh, so, mural nodule uh, ah so the two things if there is a very large cyst and reaching the mural nodule is in a distance from the, uh, from us then definitely we will aspirate the cyst reduce the content and then try to target the mural nodule however the cyst is small and if the mural nodule is clearly visible we target the mural nodule before we aspirate the cyst content because that is gives us the uh, margin of a uh, compression and risk of bleeding that's what the protocol we follow the other thing is about three different cysts in the pancreas we target the larger cyst Okay. Another question from Dr. Sh Shekhar Swaru: Does this worrisome and the high risk features applies to any cystic lesion or only for IPMN? Primarily for IPMN. And one more addition: It is also for the MCN also. MCN, but primarily this guidelines have been mainly made for IP keeping IPMN in thing in view. Yeah. And another question from Dr. Sneha B S. for a large malignant cyst with the mass effect if patient now willing for surgery any other treatment option patient is not willing for surgery what is the option if there is large malignant cyst with a mass effect and patient is not willing for surgery the treatment options are primarily palliative rather than actually any definitive therapy they are not candidates for any us intervention us interventions can only be done for benign cystic lesions not for malignant cystic lesions okay so radiation can be given that is another important thing because many of the patient who has a mass effect and they involve the bile duct and when you put a stent and these stent get blocked because of the mucinous material so giving the radiation to the mass that is going to prevent the blockage as well as progression of the malignant cystic lesion another okay, question I'm, 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 yeah please please no please 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 no you are saying something sorry i just I, yeah no another question is So how will you differentiate a case of atrophic pancreas with the dilated MPD versus main pancreatic IPMN versus chronic pancreatitis? That's a This very very interesting question, and uh, we didn't put up that uh, picture, but we wanted to highlight this. Dilated ducts can be there both in chronic pancreatitis as well as in IPMN. Dilated ducts without obstruction definitely we're looking at an IPMN. in chronic pancreatitis also if there is dilated duct but without a side branch dilated around the site a site of the dilated duct then suspect that possibility we are dealing with an ipm so without side branch dilated duct without side branch dilatation suspect ipm 
Okay, so Dr. Sudipta, the question from my side, so many molecular marker has been advised panel and when you send the panel, it costs minimum 20,000 or 16,000 rupees. Absolutely. Absolutely. Which is the most important indication where you feel when I'm aspirating the fluid, I should send for the molecular marker or this is should just be used as a research protocol. What is your uh, take home on this? Okay, so as of now, I will tell you our practice, we do not do molecular markers in patients with uh, cystic lesions primarily because of the cost constraints involved. But if I had the liberty of using it, I would try to use it in cysts with worrisome features, especially the four markers that we spoke about, that primarily because that would help us determine whether you're dealing with a, ma a malignant or a non-malignant lesion. Using genus will only tell us whether there's a mucinous or non mucinous lesion. KRS will only tell us mucinous, non mucinous. But the four gene so, mutation that we spoke about, we that's what we would actually like to add on to our panel to say whether there's a malignant or non malignant. That's the whole point. Are we dealing with malignant, non malignant? That would determine the treatment outcome. So, young patient who has a good productive life and has a worrisome features, and Absolutely. you want to make the season. Should this patient should go for a surgery or for this? Now, another question, what are the indications of pancreatoscopy? When you will advise a pancreatoscopy in a case of IPMN? So pancreatoscopy in IPMN is primarily to assess the extent of the disease and look for multifocality of the disease. As discussed in the slides earlier also, this really helps in improving the uh, in changing the surgical approach to the thing. Now, most of the centers have moved to it routinely in preoperative pancreatoscopy just to determine the extent of the disease. If I have to use it, I would use it when I'm suspecting multifocal disease, where there's a diffuse enlargement of the main pancreatic duct. And I want to make sure that this diffuse enlargement is not only because of a mucin plug occluding the entire duct, and it's, as it's because of a multifocal nature of the disease. So when there's a diffuse ductal dilatation, that's where I would prefer to use a pancreatoscopy. So I think that, that is very important message. The duct should be dilated because in IPMN, the duct will definitely 10 millimeter. But suppose the IPMN is located in the body and tail and your duct is normal in the head, then you should not do a pancreatoscopy. You will end up into a pancreatitis. So the duct exactly. should be dilated. Very important. Now, in the suppose the pancreatoscopy is not available, what is your next option? Suppose a pancreatoscopy Pancreatoscopy is not available to determine multifocality. MRI is a very good option to determine multifocality. So is you, yes, sir. What, what about the frozen section during surgery? That is routinely done by surgeons, sir. That is routinely done by surgeons. Another question, Dr. Sudipto, from my side. You have shown endosonomorphological criteria of malignancy, like a size of more than 4 cm, Thick septa. So, how many features should be there? Suppose a patient has a one feature. Will you call it as a malignant? How many features you are going to include where you say, yes, the possibility of a malignancy is high? So, all this, hello, can you hear me? Yeah. All these features have been extensively evaluated in multiple studies. And uh, one interesting one, two of these are very, very important. One of them is the thickened septa especially in an MCM. With a second set of more than 2.5, the odds are almost to the tune of 3 to 4. But if you have an enhancing neural module, the odds of detecting a malignancy goes up. So if you ask me, the combination that I would look for is a thickened set of uh, presence of an enhancing neural module. That would definitely raise alarms for me that we are dealing with a malignant mucinous cystic neoplasm. What about the thickened walls? So the thickened walls are the thickened walls are there, sir. Uh, uh, but the wall thickening is sometimes variable and not a consistent feature. But uh, that is that is that has been considered as a worrisome feature, sir. But if you ask me specifically in US, if I'm looking at two major features, it would be the septa neural nodules, sir. Thickening of wall ancillary, sir, for me. Dr. Sudipto, a very pertaining question. All guidelines, all literature says a patient of serous cyst adenoma. He don't require any surveillance. But there are less than 1% of cases 
as you have shown in your slide, these patients develop serous cyst adenocarcinoma. When you are going to suspect that this patient has serous cyst adenocarcinoma, the risk of serous cyst adenocarcinoma is particularly high when the person has got a VHL mutation. That's the one area where, so as Dr. Matthew's question was that, do you need to survey all cysts? No. But if there is a serous cyst adenoma in the setting of MH, uh, VHL, then one should raise an alarm that we are probably dealing with. If there is a solid area within a serous cyst adenoma, then definitely we are probably dealing with a malignant transformation of a serous cyst adenoma to a serous cyst adenocarcinoma. Okay. So, question is, what are the indication of surgery in the serous cyst adenoma? Question from Dr. Matthew Philip. Indication the of least, surgery. For serous cyst adenoma, the only indication of the surgery is if the patient is overtly symptomatic. In the cyst is in the head of the uh, gland, obstructing the duct, and definitely we would consider surgery. But otherwise, there is no other indication to offer surgery for incidentally detected serous cyst adenomas. Another practical question, a 35-year-old female visit you in your OPD and she is carrying a CT scan with a cyst in the body of the pancreas, which is 2 cm. You did endoscopic ultrasound. It is a unilocular cyst. Now, how will you follow? She is 35, going to survive minimum for 75 years. What is your recommendation? Because this is a very common problem which I you come across. The cyst size, as you said, is two centimeters. Am I correct, sir? Yes. Ah. So first thing, when they come in with a CT scan at our institute, we just order an additional MRCT, which is a very, very cheap step. We do not do an EUS in those patients in the first instance itself. MRCT cost is much, an isolated MRCT is much, much cheaper. And that delineates the cyst, the cyst communication with the duct, the content of the cyst. That's the, fair, that's the first line that we do in our cyst setting. And even after, at the two centimeter cyst, if the cyst is between two, uh, anything between two to four centimeters, we keep them on a yearly follow-up with an MR and just an MRCP, primarily to look for ductal cyst size increase, change in cyst caliber, or developing of worrisome features in the first three to four years. After three to four years of interval, if the patient has not further changed in either size or the cyst has not shown any worrisome features, then the cyst is followed, a patient is followed up as per, can be delayed for a length of time. Okay. So another question from Dr. Lal Krishna. How a, uh, how a experienced pancreatic cyst RFA, what is your experience of pancreatic cyst RFA when you are going to do it? I have zero experience on pancreatic cyst RFA, sir. And I probably may not be able to explain this uh, question. I know the theory behind it, but I do not have the practical knowledge of it. So another question from Dr. Lal. Maybe Krishna. you can add, sir, uh, Dr. Rajesh, if you can add to it, because I have now done pancreatic cyst RFA. Okay. So I, I'm just going to talk. So uh, another question from the Lal Krishna. What are the difficulty faced during cyst puncture? Suppose cyst near the vessel. Avoid puncturing the vessel. It will only contaminate the content of the cyst and the aspirate and therefore will lead to erroneous results. Even the glucose reports will be erroneous. So try to uh, try to puncture at a site which is predominantly avascular, number one. I prefer to use a 19-gauge needle. If it's a mucinous uh, lesion, it is very easy to aspirate with a 19-gauge needle rather than a 22-gauge or a 25-gauge needle. And I, I put the suction at the first instance when I'm inside the cyst and thereby aspirating the content of the cyst. If there are multi-loculated cysts, then the cysts that I have punctured, I try to aspirate the full content of the cyst itself. Okay, another question from Dr. Nand Kumar. Yes, proceed. Uh, chat box has disappeared. Another question uh, it's, from Dr. Is there with me? Yeah, mm -hmm. another question from Dr. Nand Kumar. Index presentation of span in the first trimester. How do you go about? What are the risk of cyst rupture if you decide to wait and watch? So first trimester. 
Yeah, so, I think this is a very specific question in a situation, and uh, it's very correctly put out also because pain does affect young women, and that's uh, that is a challenge. But uh, whenever we've had to face the circumstances, we try to delay the surgery till the uh, delivery of the baby is done. Pancreatic surgeries are not always easy. Even if the pain is in the mid body and you do a, a central pancreatectomy, there's a risk of leakage. Whipple's obviously has its own complication, so therefore we try to avoid it at the till the the completion of pregnancy then question is do all span require resection span which is symptomatic yes okay uh, another important question if the patient is asymptomatic then you will not do surgery in this span a 32 year old female came with the mass in the pancreas you do and so that can be out to be span most often than not span actually are symptomatic patient usually come in with abdominal pain that's a very typical presentation of spin it's very unlikely that you'll get a spin which is asymptomatic actually okay. and uh, whenever you have a uh, when you're talking about asymptomatic then the protocol for follow up just uh, moves into the asymptomatic arm itself okay and once you have done the resection how do you follow because these patient has a recurrence of the spin spin as such there is a uh, no specific follow up diagnostic guidelines for spin most of them are unifocal so risk of multifocal disease is also low so there is no particular guideline to follow up spin per se surgeons in our center prefer to do a repeat imaging at one year interval and then every 3 years rajesh we have five more minutes then we have to wind up tail lesions so, so uh, the uh, tail lesions how the strategy for the us aspiration tail lesions dr lal krishna that's a interesting question because uh, the, the the tail lesions have uh, it's because you have to go through the fundus of the stomach there is a risk of puncturing the spleen and adjacent to it so one has to be careful that we should do it only when it is indicated number 1 number 2 is that if you are doing a tail lesion try to focus your scope as far away uh, i try to as the tail of the pancreas and as uh, as you go there make a single puncture avoiding any blood vessels or the pan uh, or the splenic parenchyma these are the two things that i would recommend can can i add that uh, deepta suppose there is a lesion in the tail of pancreas which is otherwise an indication for surgery there is no need of doing an eos fna or aspiration that we can straight away send the patient for surgery of so course yes sir them. of course yes sir of course sir. whenever yeah. there is an indication for surgery eos does not come in at all sir and in head of the pancreas if there is a doubt it is a borderline then i think you know you have to do, take it for a, a larger surgery like a very complicated surgery like bipul in that case i think the uh threshold of for eus actually is different so in yeah. tail lesions it is different and uh head uh, in the head region is slightly different so what is your opinion on that so i agree with you completely sir and uh, and as i said earlier also one should uh, one should intervene with eus only when the treatment is going to change when the intervention is going to change the management of a patient otherwise there is no particular indication to intervene sir Rajesh, any more questions you want to discuss? Yeah, so the answer, answer to the question which was asked: How I experienced pancreatic cyst RFA. So there are literature available where the people has done the cyst RFA, especially patient with the solid lesion with the NET, IPMN, MCN, and those patients who are either not the candidate for surgery or refuse for the surgery. In those group. a cyst rfa was done and there is a short term follow up shows it has a very good results but require more studies and more follow up so cystic lesion in the form of neuroendocrine tumor in the form of ipmn or mcn those who are not willing for surgery or has comorbidity but you feel they have a good expectancy of life you can do us guided cyst rfa ablation if you have uh, completed the questions i just uh, 
want to any more questions uh, rajesh or any chat box i think you know it's time for us to stop now and uh, we have the um, uh, uh, thanks a lot dr rajesh for nicely conducting this wonderful session and uh, sudipta das chaudhary is actually you have shown everything under this uh, label of cystic neoplasm very concisely you have told and you have given a very practical approach how to do that the most interesting thing was you have shown an algorithm which can be uh, practiced in your setup or anybody's setup and you have amalgamated all the guidelines and made a guideline and take your possible messages are wonderful i am sure uh, the uh, the students as well as the young faculties young gastroenterologists who are listening to this has benefited a lot i learned a lot from this and uh, thanks a lot and we have uh, thanks sajesh for taking out your time for on this sunday and i am sure you are on a another meeting and uh, this is really wonderful so we will have the next session on uh, june 16th it's a very important uh, session on uh, <clears throat> uh, pancreas and uh, dr pramod garg is going to speak on that dr sandeep lakthakia is moderating on that and please do join and just stay tuned on this so thank you so much we are signing off now thanks a lot thanks to the uh, uh, my president dr govin makaria for uh, all the support is generating on this and also the uh, person from ist uh, nisha who is taking lot of interest on all these things as well as the technical team which has made everything possible very smooth and i also thank all the people of religious who have joined for this meeting i am sure you will benefit a lot on this one so iis is having this program continuously please tune on for this program and look at that and join early enough to learn a lot and this youtube will be available after a couple of days in our uh, iis website as well as in iis youtube channel thanks a lot thank you so much thank you dr thank master you, sir. thank you dr rajesh thank you thank you thank you so much thanks